All right. So I got a few news ones. I thought this was great. I used to do war driving. Every semester we would drive around and look at all the Wi-Fi signals in San Francisco and see how secure they are. And I quit because everybody updated to WPA. So there was no real point anymore. Um, everything else was down below 1%. But so I, but I often wondered what else we could do. And this is pretty awesome. This guy's hunting for Eagle 211P. And that is smart cars talking to the road. There are two protocols. Smart cars are going to talk to each other for like traffic negotiation. And that's V to V. And they can talk to the road, V to X. You'll have smart roads with like wireless signals and the cars will be talking to the roads to decide where to go. And he, he explains how he did it. He had to get special hardware. He had to get special hacked chips. He had to write a kernel module. And he says, if you can get an eight core processor, it will only take a few hours to compile the kernel module. Then you flash your device with this modified kernel model. You get this board that converts to another board that converts to a special radio chip to pick up the signals. And you can finally pick it up. And he drove around Oslo and he found one packet. <laughs> he drove around Oslo and he found one single packet from the, uh, he had this thing, it's kind of going through all the channels. The channels are above the normal Wi-Fi channels, above the five gigahertz, up at 5.8 and 5.9 gigahertz. You have to have a special chip, special software. He wrote a special script to hop through the channels. And he went war driving with his rig. And the end result is one packet. And this one packet has got um, GPS coordinates and then some signal here. And he found out what it is. It's a source MAC address. He figured out it's somebody's test deployment of this system. And then he drove around later and got like a few more packets. He could download his PCAP. So let me actually look at download the PCAP, see how it looks. <coughs> okay. There we are. Coda weirder. That's what we got. So now we got 76 packets. And uh, I don't know what to make of these things. That's how they look in hex. So it's got, this is, I've seen this before. This is a typical um, Wi-Fi raw wireless header. You have this radio tap header and you got um, 80211. That junk here, you got a QoS data, frame control field. Okay, now you get some MAC addresses. Transmission, here's the MAC address of the source and that's going to broadcast. Logical link control here. Snap, that's pretty common. And then you have your data, which is just 70 bytes of stuff here, which looks like it's, and he said none of it's encrypted and there is no handshake. It's not TCP, it's all broadcast. He says, uh, this is by design because it doesn't want to like associate with a car. It's designed to just broadcast stuff. And they said there can be like authentication somewhere in the higher layers. But anyway, that's what this junk looks like. So I think this is an early stage. A similar one is Bluetooth war driving, which I kind of like to do. If I could rate Bluetooth for security, which would be very interesting because there are in fact many levels of Bluetooth security. It would be good to like walk around through a crowd and find out how many Bluetooth devices are secure. But that also, there's no hardware, no software that would really scan effectively for Bluetooth war driving yet. Um, it's coming and this is coming. So if they ever get any of this working, then I can start doing the war driving again. If there's ever something you can find that's interesting. But uh, Right now, there isn't. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. And this is pretty awesome. This SnapTube app and two other apps have been caught for the third time. I think after a billion downloads, they will go on your phone, let you download YouTube videos on your Android phone, and they will serve invisible ads and click on them for you to do click fraud. And then they will offer you products and click on the products and buy them without your consent. And they've done this many times and they've been caught and they keep not taking out. All they do is uh, this package that does this was real popular. And when an article came out exposing it, they turned it off for like a month and then turn it on later. And they say this is very common what bad guys do. They turn off the server for a while and they get caught and wait for people to go back to sleep and then turn it back on. So um, that's good, clean fun. And this is pretty awesome. A wife found out if you put a cover on your phone, then it puts a little distance between the sensor and your thumb, and now every thumb works. So that's pretty awesome. There's another one of these that came out recently. It said the Android phone has face recognition, but if you close your eyes, any face will work. Yes, yeah, she, she tried the wrong thumb and it worked. Then she grabbed her husband. Hey, try your thumbs, and they work. She said, what is this garbage? Any thumb will work. Right, apparently the, the cover makes enough distance to follow it up. 
Anyway. Well, you know, they'll figure out what to do. I guess, you know, they might just tell you to quit putting on the cover. But the, the outset is everybody should turn off thumbprint recognition until further notice, until they have an update. <coughs> I know when this thing first came out, they, the hackers tried putting in like uh, silly putty thumbs and Xeroxes of a thumb, and they found that pretty much anything will work. I know in Japan, they have like in retails, they have a TV screen to make sure you're smiling enough before you go out on the floor. And people found out you can show up a picture of a magazine cover smiling. And, yeah. Anyway, um, all right, so we are here with Network Evidence. This is Network Forensics, which is good, clean fun. Um, so uh, I always go to the Wall of Sheep every year at DEF CON. Network Forensics is great, awesome stuff. So if you do your Network Forensics, of course, you can find out what's going on. You can get additional evidence. You, the great thing about Network Forensics, of course, is that you don't need to put any agents on the machines. You don't need people bringing in laptops and phones from home. You can still tear what they're doing by looking on the network. Unless, of course, you let them use VPNs or Tor or something, which is why most people want to block that stuff. Anyway, um, so. <coughs> all right. Now, if you're going to cut the door, we'll have to unlock it better. I guess I've got to unlock it. Anyway. Yeah, maybe they wanted to wait. All right. So there's four kinds of network monitoring. You can have event-based alerts like Suricata or Snort, where it's looking for no malicious activity. Yeah, okay, I gotta unlock the door then. Okay, All right. so you're gonna be event-based alerts from an IDS where it knows something is bad. Is that the college? No, no, they're testing the emergency alert system. To us? Uh, oh, emergency alert. Testing it. Okay. 30 years since the quake. Well, I sure needed to know that. That's. Hey, every 30 years, you're I guess every 30 years, they'll inform me. I guess I should like uh, have a moment of silence in honor of the quake. You know, what happened is they had a bomb alert earlier. So I think they reminded them, hey, we should make sure these alerts actually reach someone or something. Anyway, so. Right. Anyway, so then you got PCAPs, like you usually talk about, where you actually have the entire network traffic. And then you can have session information, like NetFlow, where you have some kind of summary of each conversation without the whole PCAPs, and then high level statistics about the network. <coughs> so here's various IDS type devices that will recognize known evil traffic. And the problem is they have to have a rule set. And there's two problems with that. First thing is, they have these rules, and if the rules don't include the attack, they won't pick it up. And the second thing is, the more complicated the rules get, the more they slow down. So there's a problem. Um, all right. Then you can pick up just headers. <coughs> if you just pick up headers, you just get IP addresses and times, but you don't get full packets. Now, that is a lot less data to store and hunt through than full packets, but it means you cannot reconstruct downloaded files and such. Um, you can also get high-level statistics. This is what Cisco's NetFlow does. It just has one line in the log for every full network connection. You connected to this server and downloaded this file and this many total bytes came down, that sort of thing. And the original point of this was just to bill you for telephone calls. It's that kind of information. So this does summarize what's going on. And the main point of it is so you can limit people. It's like if you get Comcast, they limit you to just 10 megabits per second. And this is how they do it with that kind of data. So the most common type by far is event-based alert monitoring, just like your antivirus, because normal people don't want to be bothered with security. So they don't want some kind of flood of data all the time. They just want to be told that something's wrong. And that's the point of these things. So your NID has a list of known bad things and alerts you when a known bad thing comes through and otherwise it shuts up. That's the simplest thing. And this is what first level SOC analysts spend their days doing is looking at alerts from the IDS. And then they resolve the ones they can, and the others they pass on to a level two SOC analyst who is like able to research and figure out more complicated things. Just like your help desk person just has a list of like the top 10 problems, and all they do is resolve those, and anything else goes to somebody else for further research. They know how to reset your password, update the software, and things like that. So Snort and Suricata are common tools here in the open source community, and there's tons of commercial NIDS systems, hardware and software. <coughs> So you got signatures someplace, and uh, 
if you have IP address and port alone, then you're just looking for known bad IP addresses. And this is something like your browser has an automatic list of known bad IP addresses and won't go there. This is what Microsoft has it in the Internet Explorer, and most everybody does. And if you use something like OpenDNS, they will automatically not let you go to malicious, known malicious domains. That's easy. A more complex indicator is going to do some kind of pattern matching for a specific pattern of traffic, and then it can do something like block something like BitTorrent. Because BitTorrent, BitTorrent clients automatically hunt to find an available port. They move around. You can't identify them by the port number or anything. You have to recognize the pattern of data in the packet. And high-level firewalls like Palo Alto can do that, and that's a much more complicated job. It takes more hardware. Yeah. Can SonicWall do the same thing of detecting it too? I know SonicWall does make layer seven uh, firewalls, but I don't know how good they are. I think they're the cheaper alternative. I'm not sure. The ones I've seen have been the cheaper alternatives, but I think they have enterprise class devices too. I don't know for sure, but I bet they can. Because I think Palo Alto raised the bar about five years ago by making them much smarter. I think all the old firewall vendors had to catch up. Thank you. Yeah, because I know um, it used to be that they would just look at the IP address and the port, and then they brought out layer seven like Palo Alto to actually connect to your domain controller. They know your Active Directory group. They know all the, they know Facebook. They know all the games. They know all the porn sites. They know all the download sites. And you can sort things by these categories. You can say, we only let G-rated stuff, except for the research team that can get everything, and that kind of thing. You can, that's what you need to do. They actually have, you know, sorted the whole internet in categories and stuff, so you can do that. Who does that? Uh, Palo Alto did it first, and I think they all do that now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Palo Alto brought, greatly improved firewall technology about five years ago their product was way ahead of all the rest it does you know before that there was actually a bunch of simple libertarian types that were very upset at this thing they called deep packet inspection and there was a strong belief that the only thing you should do is just look at the ip address and port and anything that looks beyond the header of the packet is invading your privacy there's a huge argument about it and then within a year everybody just started doing it and everybody just shut up and accepted it and now because in order to block something like BitTorrent, it has to look at the whole packet and recognize the protocol. And everybody freaked out, and they just sort of gave up and let it happen. This is what Donald Trump relies on. Like, he can totally conspire with the foreign government, and they can just do it right in public. So there, it's fine. Get used to it. That's what Mulvaney said today. Sure, sure, we conspire with foreign government to manipulate the election. It's fine. It's fine. Just get used to it. Quit complaining about it. And it appears like people will just get over it, and then that's the new normal. And that totally happened with deep packet inspection. There was a huge storm of protest. But they just ran out of breath, and we just did it. Now everybody accepts it like it's normal. So anyway, um, your sort rules are famously hard to write and very annoying. You can download them. And I have not given you homework where you write snort rules. I've thought about it. I give you YAR rules instead, which are a lot more reasonable. This is what snort rules look like. As you can imagine, it is not very fun to write this. You usually make some awful mistake. And not only that, even if you get it right, it usually is unusable because it turns out to use up too much CPU. You really have to be careful writing this rule. So this is going to look for traffic from the external network to any address to the homework network on local port 22. Here's what it's going to print when it finds it, SSH brute force login attempt. Now it's going to look for an established flow to the server and counting five items within 60 seconds. So if they attempt to connect five times within 60 seconds, then it will alert you, and that's the game. So. These things are quite useful, and whenever there's a new threat, there's a whole bunch of feeds that automatically give you uh, the start rules. A lot of people use start. <coughs> All right. And so here's another one. Um, you can get the start configuration file. This is the simplest one. Um, and I think you do it in the projects where you set up Google Cloud Service, you set up snort and see it go. And what most people do is they just subscribe to a publication of rules, like emerging threats. And then they don't have to write those rules. They just accept somebody else's updates, just like everybody else. Your antivirus, you don't write the virus definitions. You just update them from the person who made the product. So here, for example, is one that will detect a fake certificate. Um, just to show you how complicated they get, there apparently was a fake AOL certificate in 2003. And so they're now looking for a, um, it's going to print Trojan fake AOL thing when it finds certain content in there. It's going to find mail.aol.com in there and certain other content in there, which is going to indicate that there was an email that was signed and the signature contained a certain pattern of bytes, which indicates it's the right bytes. So it can get pretty messy, but that's common. Like I say, that's the emerging threats feed you can subscribe to, and you do that in the projects. All right. So anyway, um, you can do header or full packet logging. So collecting headers or full packets 
is good if you want to have some record of network traffic, and then you can decide what to do. And if you really think that you want to go to court, then you'd have to like collect full packets probably, just like you'd want full disk images and full RAM images, and you want to put a hash value on them and save, sort them somewhere safe, and then you could create a chain of custody so I collected it, and I made sure nobody tampered with it, that sort of thing. So your IDS system can retain the full session, but if you want to do a targeted collection against specific subjects, you use TCP dump for live collection. Using Wireshark for live collection is an unwise practice and you should not do it. Wireshark is not safe enough. This is a very, if you run Wireshark on Linux as root, it'll constantly warn you not to do this. The reason is because Wireshark has um, a packet engine, T-Shark, to, to collect the data. And that's all right, but then it passes it to content filters that try to figure out what it is and tell you this is SMB, this is FTP, this is HTTPS. And those are just written by a giant community of random people that just feed up those signatures. And a lot of those have bugs and security problems. It's sort of like Firefox extensions. Those are just written by a community of amateurs, and many of them are not safe. So Wireshark is famously unsafe. If you just have Wireshark sniffing on your network, there are a bunch of known packets that will take over the Wireshark. So you're not supposed to really be using Wireshark for live data collection. What you're supposed to do is collect it with TCP dump and then use Wireshark to analyze the TCP dump file later. That's what's safer. <coughs> and similarly, since Wireshark is not intended for this, Wireshark will in fact just fill up the RAM and crash. You just let it collect the live data for too long. It's not really intended to be a monitoring tool. That's what TCP dump is for. So you run TCP dump. If you do TCP dump minus X, then you get complete packet capture. So here's a Kali packet coming in. There you go. This is a get HTTP one request. And it's going to have the whole packet and print it out here on the screen and also save it in the file if you want to. You can also limit it to just 64 bytes and then you'll get just the header essentially. Now it doesn't bother to find exactly where the header ends. It just takes the first 64 bytes, which usually includes only the MAC address and the IP address and maybe a little more. And that makes it smaller and easier to store. But it's um, then of course you could not really reconstruct full requests or full files. Is it what? You can do that. You can even, you can tell the size limit on the file. You can also even set up automatic rotation. I've done this when I was under attack on one of my servers and I wanted to capture the evidence. I set it up to make a whole chain of like 10 files and rotate through them, putting like one gig in each file. So it would never be more than 10 gigs. It would always have the latest 10 gigs available. It has options to do all that. Cause of course you want to do that. And that would be appropriate for like normal catching a packet. Or if you want to archive it forever, then of course you'd set it to have bigger files and maybe automatically move them to some kind of other storage device to keep your hard disk clean. Okay, so uh, Cisco NetFlow is the standard here. It was a Cisco protocol. This is just gives you a summary of what's happening on your network. So you can go into an interface, you can see this guy's using a lot of bandwidth, this guy's not doing much, you can find out. This, the college has a different product with a different brand name, but it has the same thing. I've seen um, Tim Ryan bring it up in class. There's a web panel where they can just see how much total traffic is going down. They can see some clown in the library is downloading huge movies or something. You can totally see it. And uh, then you can just right click and block that one guy and kick him off the network if you want to, which is what you often have to do, which is why the college blocks BitTorrent, like most companies, not really because they hate BitTorrent, but because if you let people do it, they will hog up all the bandwidth and freeze the network. BitTorrent. BitTorrent is what people use to download copies of illegal movies and music. Oh, BitTorrent. Yeah, BitTorrent. Oh. And most people block it um, just to make the network flow better. Because if one clown starts downloading huge files, then everybody connected to that node can't get any bandwidth, and they complain. And if you block BitTorrent, then people use it sort of more evenly, and there's enough bandwidth for everybody. That's mostly. Of course, you also get DMCA takedown notices and stuff. You're detected as the IP downloading Harry Potter movies and stuff. That's happened to us. So the As far as I can tell, they do not slow down the internet. If you try it nighttime when there's not anybody around, you, well, if you run a speed test on Saturday or late at night, you will find it just as fast as your lane. You'll get up to like 900 megs here. So as far as I can tell, they don't slow it down. But we do have, I think, a 10 gig or two 10 gig connections to the internet, but our wiring between buildings is only one gig. So you can't get more than one gig at any of these end stations, but that's not because of our internet connection. That's the local connection. As far as I can tell, they don't slow it down. They could filter it and have only like one gig to well, and that's what Comcast does. They totally give you only so much. Although it's amazing. I have Comcast at home. It's just amazing how weird it is. Like it slows down to like one meg. 
Then I reboot my router and it goes up to 200 megs. It's crazy. And I think I'm paying for 10. And sometimes I get one, sometimes I get 200. I don't know what they're doing. It's mighty weird. Anyway, well, they're just kind of, what's that? No, I think it's Comcast themselves. Kurt knows all about this. They're upgrading equipment, they're changing things, they're having problems, they're moving things around. It's kind of hilarious. One thing I've learned years ago, which has been true for like 15 years, is that if you don't keep rebooting your router, you'll constantly go down to zero. There's some kind of, there was a known problem like eight years ago with their routers that they didn't really get a new address often enough and they would like, many people get the same area address area and hog it down. If you reboot your router, you get a fresh address in another zone. That seems to always still be true. My network will slow down to nothing. You have to reboot the router, wait five minutes, and then it goes up to something fast for a while. It's mighty screwy. So you're talking about the modem? Phone the modem, yeah. You have to reboot your modem, yeah. Not the router, but the modem, yeah. This is uh, The Doxus modem. doesn't matter if it's an all-in-one modem, if it's a rental? I don't know. I got the rental from them. If I got my own modem, it might be better. Kurt keeps telling me if I got my own modem, it would be faster. And that might well be true. It might just be their crappy modem. Just get, just get your own sound. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm never there anyway. But um, yeah, it might be probably better. Anyway, so you can get, um, instead of running Wireshark on a computer, you can buy network monitoring hardware. There was a really little laptop in a case just for monitoring network. And this is what the cops have. The cops have a little thing that looks like a phone, which just has a dial, and it tells you how much total network traffic there is around you. And so if they're trying to arrest a pedophile, they will wait outside the house in the bushes, wait for the guy to come home, go in and turn on the lights. They'll watch the meter until he's downloading a file right now. Then they put on a UPS uniform and knock on the door. When he opens the door, they rest them on the ground and go in because you have to catch them in the act. Otherwise, they will claim it was somebody else. It was an automatic process. You have to catch them in the act of doing the illegal thing. And that's what you, that's what you use to do it. Anyway, I see a chat message coming in, which I would like to get to if I can somehow make my mouse move. There we go. I got my own modem. Yeah, my own modem is better. Yeah, I've heard this from a lot of people. So if I cared, I would do that. I just can't be bothered. Anyway, so... Uh, there's open source tools. There's this thing called Argus, and you can collect data this way, you can convert PCAP to Argus file, and then you can print out the uh, and analyze it with a tool called Argus. Uh, in, years ago, I did this in a network monitoring class using Security Onion. Security Onion has a bunch of these open source tools, and they really don't work. My students are miserable. I was miserable. It's um, ridiculous. Onion, Security Onion is still a living product. They have a conference. They have meetings, but they never seem to fix anything. Everything is like... 10 years out of date and it doesn't work. It expects you to have flash in your browser and just stupid stuff. Half the products don't work. All the fun ones don't work. It's, I don't understand what the developers are thinking of. I'm sure somebody will flame me for saying this in a video, but I tried to teach a class on security onion and all it did was convince me to just throw it away and pay for storage. It's just miserable. I even had students booting up in virtual machines in a lab, like a dozen students trying to do homework and half of the things they boot up from the same ISO don't work. It's just a spectacularly buggy. Which is the thing that Security right. Onion. Right. If you have Security Onion, it's a specialized Linux, Security Onion. Oh, oh, Onion. Yes, it is a special Linux distribution just for network monitoring, and they talk about it, and there's a whole book written about it, and if you try to use any of those tools, none of them work. They're all broken. They all worked back in the days of like Windows XP and have never been updated, and it's just ridiculous. Anyway, um, however, they have an attitude, of course, because they invented all these techniques that are really used by commercial products like Spark. So as always, the commercial, the open source people say, those rotten commercial people stole my idea. And you could say that, but they made it work. So most of us are happy to pay money to those rotten bums that stole your idea and get a product that works. But technically, the open source people always have something working first, which they say is the same. The only difference is it doesn't work, which better bothers some of us. It was funny to see Linus Thorvald's not Linus Torvalds, a Stallman. Richard Stallman was at Hope with his little laptop, which he could not connect to the projector at all because it ran Linux, of course, so nothing worked. But he's the total open source fanatic, so everything had to be open source. Anyway, so here's, here you see server traffic, sort of thing you'd see here, so many bits per second, and then suddenly you get a whole spike of traffic at one point, so this would indicate a big download, a malware infection, or something nasty happening on your network. And then you can have a log scale, if you like, where this is powers of 10, to make it more clear how big the spikes are, this one area is very big. All right, so I got some cahoots. And we're here at 9A. Okay.
<coughs> it's coming to Halloween, I can tell. They play spooky music on Halloween. What's that? Can't hear you. All right. Halloween is the deadline for Brexit, which apparently they're going to meet. <laughs> apparently they have a deal, except that again, they can't get it through the British Parliament. It's probably going to collapse again, but then you will see. If you think this country is messed up, just go to Britain. We are not alone. The whole world is not safe. It sure seems that way. Of course, it always seems like that. Before this, we had Reagan and Brezhnev. Before that, we had the Black Death and the Civil War. There's always something. <laughs> Read some history. This is the best days, even now. Before, they had much worse problems. Ram is cheap. What's cheap? Ram, that's true. There's, but, I mean, people are living longer. There's less war. There's less disease. We're living in a very golden age. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, people are still coming in. I'll wait a few more minutes. <coughs> oh, I'll probably go away. No last right. usual amount of time. What's that? Yeah. Okay. Takes a while. Yeah. By Monday or Tuesday, the coughing should subside. Let's see. Anyway, all right, I guess this is it. Let's do it. Not enough contenders. So, all right, which one lets you reconstruct files? <coughs> Good. We need the full package for that, of course. All right, what does NetFlow do? <coughs> yeah, high level statistics. Just uh, one line about how many total bytes were downloaded in one session. All right. What does Snort do? That's event-based stuff. It's looking for signatures and alerting known bad events. How about TCP dump? Hmm. And let's see what happens here. I'm sort of uh, regretting this question a little. I guess full package is the best answer. Headers is not a bad answer either. You can do headers with TCP dump in the sense that you can do 64 bytes. Well, I guess I'll leave it this way, but in retrospect, I'm not sure that's a very brilliant question. Anyway. Um, and K is probably Carla. Yeah. And Anton looks like a real name. All right. So anyway, uh, that's why they're extra credit. Those cahoots are always a little unfair. Anyway, so setting up your network monitoring system is actually pretty tough to do. Um, in the old days, you could use hubs, but hubs aren't fast enough for any modern network. And now you pretty much have to, and there are um, monitor ports on enterprise class switches, which never made any sense to me. You have like 10 gig ports, you have 32 of them, and then you mark one of them to be the monitor port. So a copy of every package is supposed to go out the monitor port. And this lets you in you know, an obvious secret. Obviously, if all those ports are screaming at 10 gigs, there's no way one 10 gig port can carry all that traffic. So the monitor ports don't really handle traffic unless the traffic is well below the maximum. This is something I heard from Cloudflare. Matthew Prince told me this. <coughs> if you buy a port, a, a switch with like 32 10 gig ports, they are not designed for all those ports to be screaming at 10 gigs all the time. Not at all. They don't have enough RAM. 
They expect just a burst of 10 gig occasionally, but they run much less, like 20 times less than the maximum, and they can't handle it because they tried to do that because Cloudflare is not a normal network. A normal network is like this room. You have 25 machines connected. Most of them are turned off. Even if they're turned on, most of the people aren't downloading files. They're just reading a web page or something. It's not like they're all screaming maximum bandwidth. That's why everybody hates BitTorrent. BitTorrent is like taking every water faucet in your house and turning it on full blast and just leaving it all day and all night. Your thing is actually screaming with bandwidth all the time, and nobody's network is actually designed for that. It's designed for sort of the average, where people download a file and then they do nothing, and they just have enough bandwidth to serve them. And so the switches are designed the same way. So that's um, and so Cloudflare actually had to build their own switches because in their situation with proxy servers, they when they want 32 10 gig ports, they mean all 32 of those ports are going to be screaming 10 gigs all day long, and it's not okay if they can't really do that. And so they have to build their own switches for that. But anyway, um, so this is the game here. So you typically buy network tech. That's the way to do it. You buy a special hardware device that is just to make an extra copy of the traffic coming through. But there's a much more subtle problem. <coughs> you don't know where to sense the network. Think about this room. If I turn on all these machines and people are doing things, somewhere there's one route to the internet. Now I could sense that and that would be fine, but what if somebody shares a file from one machine to another inside the room? I'll never see that because the traffic does not go to the internet. What if there's a wireless network? It turns out to be, in fact, extremely difficult to sniff traffic because the traffic does not all even go down one wire somewhere. Anyway, that's an issue. So um, your IDS typically can't perform intrusion detection and network surveillance simultaneously. You typically have two things. You have one just recording it, and then another one trying to do IDS on it to detect the attacks. Um, if you try to capture full content, it's going to use up all the CPU and RAM on the device, and it won't be able to also compare it to a list of signatures. Um, all right. So anyway, you have to define your goals. Uh, make sure you have the legal right to analyze the traffic. This is a big issue, of course. Um, in a shared environment like this. Um, that's why at first everyone thought these Palo Alto Layer 7 firewalls would be illegal because technically it's looking at every email you send and every page you download and every URL. And I guess we're all just getting used to that, but people weren't sure you'd have the legal right to do that. Um, so then you got to put in hardware and software, secure this stuff, place it on the network in the right place, which is really not that easy. And there's another thing that really follows it up. I saw this at the Packet Hacking Village a couple of years ago at DEF CON which is multi-path TCP. You can get like four internet ISP contracts, and when you do a big download, you'll get some packets from this one, some from Comcast, some from AT&T, some from Verizon. And so you can't even reconstruct the flow with the data from one tap. You have to somehow correlate the data across many taps to reconstruct the flow. But people do it because it's faster. But it certainly makes it harder on your network surveillance team. And this is why everybody in Britain is screaming about DNS or HTTPS. Now you got encrypted DNS traffic that you can't see, and so all their plan of monitoring you based on DNS is shot. Anyway, so your hardware is tough, so <coughs> the best stuff is to get special taps. One use servers, um, you typically run them on Linux. It used to be FreeBSD for firewalls and network devices, but now Linux is apparently better. Linux kernel has been improved. Until a couple few generations ago, the Linux kernel was not very fast at network traffic, and FreeBSD was better. Anyway, there's some, um, you can use special software, a special socket to make it faster. So if you plan ahead, then you can buy commercial solutions like Solera Network and RSA that will cost a bunch of money, put it on your network off and come in the form of hardware, and then it will automatically do all this stuff for you. And that's, of course, much friendlier to the administrator. You just open a web based panel and it does most of the thinking for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, I don't, I don't know. It's possible they'll update pre-ASD. This is just the, uh, the situation as a couple of years ago when they wrote the textbook. Okay. But I mean, the reason it has to be here is because for years it was all free BSD. And apparently that Linux is finally catching up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Good, good point. Anyway, so Security Onion, I mentioned, this has got all these network monitoring, all these network analysis tools, and it sounds good, but when you actually try to use it, nothing works. Um, but in principle, it has the open source prototype version of all the things that would later turn into SNORT. So you can see DNS analysis of who's been going there and get pie charts of everything, except of course, none of it works. Um, anyway, and here's the point, where do you put your sensor? Even if you pay for a tap and you've got a device, you can connect to a cable and get all the tracker, where do you put it? And it turns out, this is not simple. Are there really choke points? 
where a lot of traffic that's important to you goes, and you have to decide how you're going to do it. And then there's more trouble. You probably have network address translation. So if you get everything at like the internet at egress, you probably don't have IP addresses that are in fact accurately pointing to the devices anymore because things have been translated. So it can be quite a job. You know, you're getting, getting, you can collect the traffic, but correlating the traffic from several points and putting it back together can be a drag. I know I've seen you back there with the Snort projects or the, the, the Splunk projects, try to find the MAC address going to the IP address. This turns out to be a whole lot harder than you might think it would be because the IP address changes and the MAC address changes as you travel through the network. And wherever your sensor is, you see how the traffic looked at one point, but that may not be the answer to the question you care about. <coughs> anyway, so there's lots of ways to uh, adjust your network traffic. And um, if you want to connect everything, you might use multi protocol label switching. This is another problem. If you go to WAN networks, if you take the last couple Cisco courses, there are a whole bunch of ISP protocols that nobody ever hears of. And they're, um, it can get pretty complicated. And if you have a large multi location company, then some of your traffic is no longer just TCP IP, it is these other. WAN protocols, and you have to cope with that. So anyway, your sensor should, of course, be somewhere safe. You got to patch its OS and document everything. And it's a good idea to have integrity monitoring of your OS with something like Tripwire, so you will know if your network monitoring system gets compromised and infected. That does happen. Home routers get infected a lot. There was a guy that made a botnet of about a million home routers about eight years ago and used it to scan the whole internet. There are persistent reports of home routers to get infected, and now they add malware to all the web pages that people view. You can totally do it. You can infect enterprise class routers too. And there was just another um, vulnerability last week. A whole major enterprise class firewall had an open administration port. Everybody can log in without the password. This kind of stuff keeps happening. So it's an issue. So anyway, you have to evaluate your stuff. Are you really getting the traffic you need? Can you really keep up with it? Um, you should be checking to see how efficient it is. Most network monitoring solutions will just silently drop packets when the traffic gets too high. So you should be aware of that. This happened to me at the Wall of Sheep, the contest where I eventually bought a team that won the Black Edge. I was almost useless because I was trying to tap the VoIP phone calls. And it turned out that that network had so much packet loss that none of the VoIP phone calls were complete enough to hear anything. So I wasted all my time trying to do that. And the other guy got all the points. So he got like 1,200 points and I got like 50 points and we won. And I said, well, you know, technically I was on the winning team, but in fact, I was pretty useless. Um, but anyway, technically, I won the black badge, sort of. Anyway, uh, that's why I tell people I'm not the best of the best. I'm the worst of the best. Anyway, so. Um, all right, so that's network data analysis. Wireshark is wonderful and famous. It's very good at looking at packets and figuring out what's going on in them. <coughs> but you can't make anything too big. You should uh, be looking at some small packet or it'll take forever to load and forever to hunt through. It's just nice and graphical and easy. So, Here's, for example, some, there's some scenarios you can drop down here. And so uh, this investigation starts in December. Somebody accessed the system and they ran RAR and FTP and you have complete packet data. So you can look at the prefetch of that machine. The prefetch, remember, on a Windows machine list, the last 128 programs that have been run and when they were run. So you can see when FTP was executed and now you know what time to look at. So there's a PCAP file. And you can have them open here. I've got them on this machine. You can download them and see them. Uh, here we go. It's scenario one, first part. And so if you open this PCAP file, I've got not very much data here, just 35 packets. So it's nice and easy. You can see a couple FTP sessions. You can go to uh, statistics conversations. You get a high level summary. It will tell you there's two conversations, one on port 21 and one on port 20. Uh, so this is typical FTP transfer. You have the controlled data on one port and um, the actual transfer on another port. So I can take this 21 and I can limit to display filter. And now I'll see just that data. Oh, I should have seen, well, let's follow the stream here. If I right click, follow TCP stream. All right, what is this nonsense? Okay, right click, follow TCP stream. There we are. So this is, <coughs> Following the stream shows you the high level data like the user would have seen it without all the addresses. And so this is an FTP login with a name and a password and transmitting some file called eddy transfer.bit. So that's what's there. And if I go up here, this is TCP stream zero. I can change this to a one 
and see the next stream, and I can follow that. And that's the actual file coming down, and you can see here that it's raw. And you can save the file right from Wireshark. You just have to go to raw, and then save as, and this is going to be, um, there's a name that's recommended for this, which is somewhere in my slides. Um, yeah, file.rar. Okay. I'm going to call it file1.rar because I already made one. All right. Anyways, that will save it as a rar file, which uh, should have gone here, but apparently it saved it somewhere stupid. Save as applications are. Downloads. There we are. So I have this raw file. And if I try to open it, it's going to tell that's doing some garbage. What is this garbage? Okay, I guess I have to right click. I don't know what Mike Max do with the L archiver. That should have been the L archiver. Oh, that's right. I have to choose some place to put it, like downloads and extract. And now it's going to tell me I need a password, which I don't have. So on a Mac, I don't know how to see what's in there. On a PC, I do. There's probably some similar Mac utility, but um, this is the thing to know about zip archives, and it's also true of RAR archives. Even if you encrypt them, the file names are not encrypted. You can see what's in there, even though you can't open it, so you can see the contents. Anyway, <coughs> so with the WinRAR, you can see the names of the files anyway, although you can't decrypt them unless you find the password somewhere. So, all right. Now, if you do need a password, <coughs> there are various standard ways to do it. One is to use standard hacking utilities like John, where you have a password list of all the known passwords. You can try that. Another thing you can do is take the computer you're examining and take every string off the hard drive and use that for a list, hoping that they save the password unencrypted somewhere on the hard drive. Those are tricks, and sometimes those tricks work, and sometimes they don't. If somebody has like a password manager and they actually use like 25 character random passwords, then you're hosed, you will never find it. But most people don't actually do that. Instead, they use the same password everywhere or something, and then you can pretty much make it that way. Anyway, you can look at Wireshark. You can easily answer a question. Like here is somebody, it's trying to log in, user and then password. Now, if this was an automatic process like malware, it would respond within a fraction of a second every time. But you can see here, it asked a question, and then two seconds later, it answers one question, and then another two seconds to answer the next question. This is a real human taking time to respond. So that's the kind of thing you can get easily out of Wireshark. And another thing to look for, of course, is typographical errors. If they misspell something and then re-enter it, then you're definitely using a human instead of an automated process. So here's the file from the first one. What he was dumping here is PW dump. So even though I can't get in here, I don't really need to because these are standard hacking tools. And now I can see what hacking tools are downloading. <coughs> so from here, I can suspect that they probably cracked the hashes on whatever system this was going to. So now I probably can assume that whatever passwords were used on that machine have been stolen and the accounts in that machine's password hashes should be investigated. They may very well have stolen credentials from that machine and then intruded further on the network that way. So anyway, here's another scenario. You detect a port scan coming from your DMC from an Apache server and nobody was supposed to be doing this at that time and you have no user logged into the server at that time. So somebody, is somehow running code on your web server without logging in with SSH. And this is very common. This is a PHP. You can see it here. You're going to see them calling some file called PHP. This is a PHP shell. PHP shells are bloody awesome. PHP shells let you run commands on a web server without logging in, and they don't go in the command history log. So it works like this. You do post requests here, and then get requests to some other file. So they found some login page that had a file upload vulnerability, which is by far the most common PHP vulnerability. They were able to upload a PHP shell. This happens all the time. This is like WordPress installations. This is why PHP is famous for being insecure. Everybody loves PHP because it's easy to write the code. But if you do put up a page, a website with PHP, usually within a year or two, you get hacked. Because the way it's normally used, you add forms, you add bulletin boards, you add feedback forms, and pretty soon somebody makes a mistake, and there's some way to upload files of the wrong type. It is too easy to make that mistake. So then you can upload a PHP shell with just some funny name, and now you can start passing up parameters with commands like netstat and tasklist, so you can now execute these commands. Now, if you look at Wireshark for this one, you're gonna see HTTPS. If you get encrypted data, uh, before the Snowden leak a few years ago, 
you could actually decrypt encrypted data because you read TLS 1.0 and 1.1, it would use the same secret over and over. You could actually sometimes steal that secret from a system or a browser and decrypt the data. <coughs> so everybody and my brother updated to TLS 1.2 and 1.3, and now there's a different encryption key for every session. So that is almost impossible now. Anyway, that's called forward secrecy. With the older versions, you can actually get the private key from the server and decrypt it, and you can import it into Wireshark, and Wireshark can decrypt the data. So this is technically possible in Wireshark, but it's almost unimportant anymore. Almost no modern systems are using those old TLS versions because there was a huge public relations scandal caused by Snowden leaking out the fact that the NSA is spying on everybody. Anyway, then you can actually see encrypted data after decrypting it. All right, and that's what decrypted data looks like. You can now see the posts going here, and then you're running SQL map, just like you did in some of the projects. Um, you run SQL map to find HTTP, uh, uh, you find SQL injection vulnerabilities. And here's a PHP shell upload. So here he is posting a file, tempuimz.php, and once he's uploaded that file, he now has a PHP shell, so now we can go get and put command equals echo unzip that view task list. He's now executing shell commands on the server without logging in, without really being seen as an SSH user, just through the web interface. This is very common. That's PHP shell. Script kitty's favorite thread. And so you'll see all the commands here. <coughs> so here he is creating a new account called backup with a password of secret and putting it in the administrators group. That's the kind of stuff that's easy to do through your PHP shell. There's other products out there like NetWitness Investigator that will um, take all your traffic and then give you a nice web-based interface and show you all the IP addresses and domains that have been to and the total amount of traffic in different categories like DNS and SSL and NetBIOS. Uh, there are a lot of tools like this and there are fancier ones and cheaper ones. There's free ones like this and there's all kinds of commercial tools that really get nice. They give you a nice display and traffic all sorted into different categories. So, for instant response, you can have one of those things, but anyway, you often want logs like we're doing with uh, Splunk. All your devices have logs. You want your DHCP logs, and you want your firewall logs, your IDS logs, and everything, collapse all those logs into one place. And so your sensors may catch part of it. You know, the attacker comes in. Um, until recently, a lot of attackers used malware, and that is now considered an amateur move. More and more people are targeting how to live off the land, or you do not actually use any malware, because people are getting too good at catching malware carbon black and endpoint detection and junk all over your system. So if you use known malware, you're kind of an idiot and you're going to get caught. If they do, then you'll get an IDS signature. Anyway, all right. Um, but what you can do is look at authentication logs. They're probably going to be logging in with accounts, hopefully at unexpected times or unexpected places. That's another way to get there. And if they alter the operating system or add a file in a sensitive location, then you might be able to check that with your OS integrity tools. Um, that's one level of heuristic protection. Anyway, your server-based logs are on the individual system, and that means a server uh, attacker that hacks in can delete those logs or modify them, so network logs can be better. <coughs> it's possible to connect your network monitoring system at layer two, so it does not have an IP address at all, and make it read-only, where it does not transmit any traffic at all, and then, uh, well, you actually you do have to respond to ARP requests. But anyway, you can connect normally with no IP address, and then it cannot be compromised. It cannot be detected with a network scan, and it cannot be um, compromised because it cannot phone a home. It doesn't have an IP address, so it cannot send any traffic off the land. And that's what you should do. You can easily make an invisible, undetectable copy of all the network traffic that way. And that's what you should do. And that's something the attacker cannot find or destroy. So log aggregation, as you've seen, is a big deal in Splunk. You have logs all coming in. They're all in different formats. And so it's a problem. It's essentially the same problem Google has. You have the web, all this data. It's not organized into a, any pattern. And you somehow have to index it anyway. And Splunk and Google have both done a pretty good job of coping with that, re, with that difficult problem. All right. We got more cahoots. This one. And it must be 9B. <coughs> so 
interesting link. In my opinion, there's a defect in their bidding file. I've heard of a shower note. <laughs> these files are great. The old uh, game at the blocks that you turn had all these great MIDI used, Hungarian Rhapsodies. For like 10 kilobytes, you can have a beautiful music like this, but it's like a player piano. All it has is which note and for how long. So it only takes like a few bytes to store each note. All right. I'll give it a few more seconds and then we will proceed. All right. So you want to do IVS or surveillance, but you can't do them both at once. Your IDS system can be configured to do one word. It can store the traffic or analyze it, but the same system can't do both. It would use too much CPU. All right, which one uses custom Lua decoders? I didn't mention this in the lecture, but this, I think it was on one of the slides. Everybody has to use a security language, and they use Lua just to give us all that. Wireshark, I you guys know, Wireshark extensions are written in Lua. I have no idea what the hell Lua is. There's so many Lumen languages. I wish they would just use Python for everything, but they forgot to ask me. All right. Which one ensures that operating systems remain intact? <coughs> Tripwire? All right, a file format used by hackers to execute commands on a server. PHP shells. All right, so I got M Hemo, and the other two are repeats Y Kang and Anton. Okay, I have recorded the winners. So, oh, there's a new project I wanted to point you to, which is really quite easy, and you'll probably have fun doing it. Um, so if you go to 152 and projects, I put up the Yara project. Yara is very easy, much easier than Snort. And now it's gotten easier than ever. It used to be hard to install, but they've upgraded it. They just had a new version come out like two days ago, and it's a lot nicer. <coughs> so you download this windows file and just install it unzip it it's a command line tool the yara is the only thing we're going to use the other thing is like a configuration utility i don't know what it's for you don't need to use it so you put those in your downloads folder and now you can run yara so you can make an example rule here that will just look for the string evil <coughs> one thing about yara it just looks for patterns of bytes it cannot do anything about encryption or anything, which is a major limitation, but that's what it does. It really is nothing more than grep. It just looks for patterns of bytes. So this looks for the string evil, and if it finds it, it prints out example rule. So now you make one file containing good and one file containing evil, and when you scan that directory, it finds that the bad file contains evil. So that's all it's doing. Grep could do the same thing, and that's what it does. One thing, by the way, I found out the hard way, is if you do this in PowerShell, instead of a command prompt, it automatically makes everything Unicode and nothing works. Although Yara does have the option for Unicode, but you have to write different rules for that. This is of course a big issue because almost all Windows systems have everything in Unicode now because everything is international. So that is a thing to be aware of. 
And by the way, the yard documentation for the new version is totally not written for Windows. It has a bunch of command line commands that only work on Windows. Anyway, so um, then you get something. I got this thing called Minesweeper. I made a modified version of Minesweeper for another class, and it'll do just to have a file. And you can download some YAR rules. There's Packer compiler signatures. This will identify um, Packers and compilers. So you download this thing, and see it has a bunch of uh, checks. These are YAR signatures to detect different kinds of files. And if you run that on Minesweeper, it will detect a bunch of things about it. Is PE32, is a Windows GUI, is packed, has rich signature and something else, so you can get a flag to turn in. Anyway, it can find various signatures it found inside that file, telling you what type of Windows software it is. And then I got a bunch of extra crap. Here's something with 100 files you can unzip. And there are various things to find among those 100 files. First, you can find all the files that contain evil. There's two of them. And then you can find all the files that contain um, three bytes of 0, 4 in a row. Um, an unprintable ASCII character. And then you can find bunch with this pattern, a 0, 4, 3 to 6 bytes, a 0, 5, 3 to 6 bytes, and a 0, 6, a more complicated rule. And so anyway, that's all. Those are all very easy to do. And there's a link here to a tutorial that will show you how to do that. <coughs> so check it out. I'll stick around for a while and see if people want to help out of projects. And I will be out of town, but I will be able to guest lecture on Monday, which somebody will open this room for, and I will have a remote lecture on Thursday. And the Tuesday and Wednesday classes will not meet next week. So that's it, I think. I'm going to stop the share and see if any chat messages. Okay, good. All right. Have a good night, folks. All right.